Unmask the Supernatural. Explore the history and future of parapsychology. Analyze legends and folklore. And welcome entertaining and informative guests as they probe irresistible mysteries that continue to haunt us. They may not always agree. In fact, they won't. But the dueling parapsychologists provide an investigative podcast that's not afraid to seek the truth and separate nonsense. With your hosts, Elliot Van Dusen and Daryl Walsh. Welcome to the Dueling Parapsychologist Podcast. All right. All right. Hello, everyone. I'm a parapsychologist, and my name is Elliot Van Dusen. And I'm Daryl Walsh, and I'm also a parapsychologist. And this is the Dueling Parapsychologist Podcast. Um, because this is the first episode, uh, we're just going to cover off a few little things here. Um, we're just asking if anyone is interested to support us on Patreon. Uh, it's uh, patreon.com slash dueling, D-U-E-L-L-I-N-G, parapsych, P-A-R-A-P-S-Y-C-H. And it's for our viewers um, to uh, kind of get some benefits as well. Uh, so if you support us, we have different uh, levels of membership. I created uh, the viewer, which is a $5 a month fee. And that'll give you early access uh, to all our episodes, 24 hours in advance before the public. Uh, the next level is the scientific supporter, and that's $10 a month. That'll also give you the 24-hour early access, and it'll also give you a shout-out on audio and video uh, versions of our podcast. The next level is the friend, which is $20 a month, and same benefits, uh, except you also get a personal Zoom call to uh, have a parapsychological question that you may have answered by Daryl and I. The next level is the Ghost Hunter, which is $75 a month. Again, you get all the same benefits, but you also get a one-time uh, signed copy of Supernatural Encounters, True uh, Paranormal Accounts from Law Enforcement, which is uh, my second book that I wrote. And then the last um, kind of membership level that we have, which is quite expensive, um, but it also has probably the best benefit, uh, it's called the Protégé, and that's um, $100 a month. You get all the same benefits, except you'll get a one-time in-person observer status during a real field investigation. And that's for Nova Scotia residents uh, residing in Nova Scotia only, obviously. Um, you'll need your own transportation to get to the site. Um, and that's, that's obviously, I mean, I know we're going to have listeners from all over the world, uh, but unfortunately, uh, you know, unless you're in And Nova the Scotia, pandemic is not helping the whole situation either, so. No, exactly. So we'll, we'll start that out. Uh, if we do happen to, uh, you know, get a protege uh, membership, then uh, next time we have a field investigation, um, we'll bring you along, show you how to use the equipment, let you use the equipment. Uh, you'll get one-on-one -on -one time with Daryl and I, and, you know, we can ask us anything you want during that time. Yeah. Uh, we're also on YouTube as well, so look us up on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, um, and uh, PPRI.net has all our uh, you know social media contacts and stuff like that. So check out uh, check out the website. And uh, the reason why we want to do this podcast, really, Daryl, you and I have both had a couple of different people approach us at different times yeah. in our career, saying that you guys should do a podcast. Like it would be really <laughs> interesting. So the reason why we decided to do it is, is to do it for, for you guys. Um, what we hope to do as well is, is cover off some misconceptions in parapsychology and some misinformation that is out there. And also just create some awareness in, in the field of parapsychology, which is still very active in today's society. And also to provide some entertainment, um, especially during the pandemic, like you said, a lot of people working from home. Uh, I, I hear podcasts are up people listening to podcasts so yeah uh, hopefully you give us a listen and parapsychology just to go to that point uh i don't think has ever been as widely studied as it is right now um we don't have the ryan research uh center but it seems to have spread out to different faculties and for both for and against of course so uh for and for the results are both kind of good and bad so it's a mess but at least i think um it's being taken much more seriously now and um so that's why we want to help you um know what's good what's bad and um if if it's just an opinion we'll say it 
And believe me, we are going to have differences in opinion. <laughs> Usually do. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> and don't even bring up you know what. <laughs> I, I can't remember if that's in here or not, but it, it better it, not be. It may show up. Um, so, Daryl, why don't you uh, why don't you tell uh, our viewers uh, a little bit about yourself and your history and how you got involved in uh, in parapsychology? Well, it's funny because I wanted to be a military policeman, and um, and then a paralegal and an insurance, and then back to military police. But, however, being uh, having glasses and being gay at that time, uh, or I am gay, but I mean, at that time of nine, roughly 1980, um, 81, um, there was no chance of my getting in to doing that. And so, uh, anyway, a uh, friend was, uh, his father was a psychologist. It kind of inspired me to get into it. Eventually, I was um, going to get into psychology. Um, I'm at the master's level now um, to help um, stop the increase in suicides and, and all that in gay teens and uh, addiction problems and everything. Um, however, <clears throat> and I should have guessed this, because <laughs> when I was a kid, um, my aunt and uncle used to come and they'd visit, and that's fine. They'd sit out in the living room. Mom's in bed, right? Because they'd come at 8 o'clock and I'd, mom would put me to bed at 7. But um, the way the living room was structured, the, it was out of sight of the doorway to my bedroom. So I would creep out and listen. Because after an hour, when they did all the, you know, how's work, you know, and all that BS that we do, um, they started talking about ghost stories and stuff. And I don't know, I don't remember if they did it all the time. And I only remembered this just two weeks ago. But the main influence was my uncle Aloysius, of course, who gave me all his ghost books when I used to go visit him in, in Cape Breton. Yeah. Anyway, um, so I was all set to become a clinical psychologist <clears throat> when I saw, um, I saw an advertisement to uh, teach parapsychology at NS, NSCC and the Nova Scotia Community College. And at the, the same time, I was also in a parapsychology, the PhD, uh, parapsychology at the time. And um, so I began teaching. Well, of course, once the media got a hold of the fact that there was somebody actually teaching this, they started, you know, <clears throat> calling me and, and uh, to do interviews and, and all this kind of thing. So, um, yeah, so that, I mean, that led to my, almost simultaneously, um, setting up a bunch of us who don't live in Nova Scotia anymore, <laughs> um, had set up the Center for Parapsychological Studies in Canada, which is still active 25 years. It's our 25th anniversary. Oh, my God, I forgot it in February. Um, <laughs> anyway, and so therefore we, we did the, um, we did the uh, classic ghost hunting as well as regular research and because that was more important than the actual ghost hunting. However, if there was something that seemed to be, you know, in the late 90s in particular, seemed to be um, strong enough that we might actually see or hear um, something. And there is a few things that did happen because you were in the group, mm -hmm. uh, in particular the house on St. Margaret's Bay Road. Yes. Um, there was another, uh, the cellar bar and grill, one of uh, the investigators got grabbed on the shoulder as well. Yep. yep. So there were a few things. And, uh, but then, anyway, then I was also at the same time writing books, Ghosts in Nova Scotia, Ghosts and Legends of, uh, of Atlanta, Canada, That Which Survives, the um, Case for the Near Death Experience. And um, so anyway, um, that was fine. Then life intruded as my parents were quite elderly and um, took, um, just needed a lot of help for over a decade. So anyway, uh, while I was doing that, I was, I was working on Bigfoot and I was studying 7,200 Bigfoot reports trying to see, you know, prior to 1998, because after that the internet was so, um, um, wide, wide that any, if all the BSers were calling in with, you know, with the report. So I picked 1998 as the, as the cutoff date, 1920 as the beginning, because mm -hmm. prior to that, um, the newspapers would make it all up. So I, while I was doing that, I was thinking, how could I turn this into a project on ghosts to try to get to 
Um, you know, is, is there anything that, uh, you know, is common to them? Um, are there some things we're missing? Uh, is there something we need to research? Uh, is there just staring us in the face or what? And for the Bigfoot, um, which I haven't quite finished the book and is going to irritate a lot of people because some of their most cherished beliefs are totally wrong, absolutely wrong. And, uh, but I'm not going to say because, of course, the book's coming up. Uh, but started Ghost Project Canada and, of course, brought you on board. And uh, our idea is to collect every single supernatural event across Canada and then do a geographical and statistical analysis. So if you want to know where werewolves are most popular, we'll say, just off the, the top of my head, because I don't have the figures, I haven't done that research on werewolves yet, uh, I'd say Quebec and Nova Scotia. Um, obviously, Manitoba has Ukrainian, a lot of Ukrainian heritage, mm -hmm. so they're going to have different stories. BC, it's all Bigfoot. Um, and UFOs. Yeah. Yep. There was never any ghosts until recently. Yeah. <laughs> it was all Bigfoot. But I mean, and obviously around the coast are, um, are uh, ghost ships and very many wandering women. And the Atlantic provinces, in particular Nova Scotia, but the Atlantic provinces and Newfoundland have some of the really the uh, strongest, most unique phenomena. Uh, other than across the country. The rest of the country, you know, um, once you hit Ontario, it's pretty much the usual thing. Um, but we want to hear the usual thing. Um, but down here, you start to get weird things. And of course, in Newfoundland, it's, it's really rich folklore. So the whole point, we do the statistical and geographical analysis. Then we submit it to all the provincial archives and federal archives in Ottawa. So that other people in the folklore departments, uh, you know, growing up and want to get into folklore and, and uh, try to understand our world and, and what it, it was um, at the turn of the 21st century. Because right now we look back 100 years to Helen Creighton and how it was, you know, and at the beginning of the 20th century. So before it's lost and then comes the pandemic. And of course, it's the older people who have the best stories. Um, the pandemic has not helped at all, needless to say. However, um, we're still working on it. So also besides Elliot's in, um, introduction about Patreon and that, um, we do want to hear your stories, your favorite stories. If it's not, doesn't have to have, to have happened to you. It could be something you grew up with, something your parents told you about, um, or your favorite. Um, actually, be interesting to find out what your favorite fictional character is, actually. Um, and it's interesting because we're watching as Slender Man goes from fiction to nonfiction. Mm -hmm. And that's really interesting. I'm old enough. Together, we have 60 years experience in parapsychology. I'm old enough that I saw crop circles appear, satanic panic. Um, the bullshit repressive, uh, repressed memory syndrome, chupacabra, uh, <laughs> slender man, and am I missing any, um, crop circles. And so I've been very lucky to actually watch society develop these things that don't exist. Um, and that'll be, that'll be a, a discussion I'm sure you and I will talk about. But anyway, I don't want to hog this, turn this over to you, Elliot, give a... Yeah, no, that's that, that's great. And uh, for anyone that's looking for any other information too on Ghost Project Canada or to send us your stories, you can go to ghostprojectcanada.com, and uh, it's got Daryl and my uh, contact information on there. And uh, in fact, Daryl just ran an ad not too long ago on Facebook, and we had I want to say at least a dozen people reach out with stories. Yep. And we make time to call you, record them. Um, we also provide confidentiality. I know some people are for whatever reason embarrassed to talk about the paranormal or don't want people to know about their experience because it's private um, so we also take that into account and we can use um, pseudonyms and mask things and um, you don't have to worry yeah. about that. And the interesting thing about that um, if it is a private home or something somewhere that might cause embarrassment to somebody you can disguise it but you have to make the disguise close enough that it's still worth something. So if it was in Brampton, 
don't say it's, it's actually in Trois-Rivières because then that'll go into the Quebec statistics. So, you know, there will be times where you, you know, can't say um, Uncle Clancy's house on Brantford Street in, in um, Yorkville, uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, so just change it around a little bit, but try to keep it as close to possible as the truth, um, just because, and if you can't, then just send it to us and we'll use it, we'll blind it so that nobody, Absolutely. nobody can see it. Yeah. Nobody will know the details because it's more important we get the details than it is to, um, and we, you know, anything else. And we'll keep it confidential. We'll do whatever it needs to be done to get the, as uh, comprehensive as we can with this. And it's also ghostprojectcanada at gmail.com too for those that don't like trolling. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Um, so my background's a little bit different than, than Daryl's. Um, obviously, I, I got he it. got to be a policeman. <laughs> so Daryl wanted to be a military uh, police, but yeah, I actually did uh, 15 years service with the uh, RCMP. Um, I was born in Ontario, but grew up in Nova Scotia, and I sh was shipped all over the place. Uh, first posting was Penticton, British Columbia, which is home to. Uh, lake Okanagan's uh, lake monster Ogopogo. Which I asked him to look into and he did not do. I, I spent many nights patrolling and did not see <laughs> lake, uh, the lake monster. But you didn't submit a report about that. I did not. No, no, I will admit that. I, slept. I, I was doing enough paperwork and policing that uh, I didn't have time to do parapsychological reports. But um, no, I didn't, I didn't see anything out there. I actually surprisingly didn't even really uh, see or there was no reports in Penticton for the three and a half years I was there of UFO sightings or anything like that. Um, then I went up north uh, to Yellowknife uh, where I, I spent most of my time on homicide and got to travel all over the, uh, the Northwest Territories. Um, now, I didn't witness this myself, but there was actually a UFO sighting while I was up there um, in a small community called Delaney. And uh, two RCMP officers and uh, several um, townsfolk actually witnessed uh, this UFO at the dump. And it was taken seriously enough that they actually flew in the next day, the RCMP officers from the community, into Yellowknife to de debrief them about it. Um, and uh, there is some video somewhere still on YouTube of uh, the UFO sighting, so that was really cool. Uh, then I came back to Nova Scotia, I got posted in Chester, which has, and Daryl, you would know more about this, but I believe Chester has some sightings of the ghost ship teaser yep. down there. Um, so I was down there, again, nothing, nothing out of the ordinary uh, for Chester. Then I got promoted to a corporal work downtown Halifax. Once I retired, um, I was able to do uh, more things uh, publicly with the RCMP. Things are changing in policing. Um, you know, when I first joined, you certainly didn't want to self-identify yourself being involved in the paranormal. I just found it was a very like closed off culture. Uh, as things have kind of progressed now, I mean, people are, uh, like you weren't allowed beards in the RCMP, for example, up until uh, maybe six months before I retired and then they changed the policy that you can now have a beard, just like local police forces and the military. So, I mean, things are certainly changing. Um, and progressing, which is which is good. But uh, now that I'm retired, I'm able to do this full time. Whereas before, it was always uh, kind of at the side of my desk. And I kind of got involved with it from shows like Unsolved Mysteries, because I was always interested in being a police officer, and they sh and I was always interested in homicide. And so Unsolved Mysteries always had those unsolved murders, and that. That's why it kind of interested me. But then they would always show like UFOs and ghosts and sure, paranormal sure. stuff. And that also really interested me. And it wasn't until I moved to Halifax, my mother actually saw an article of Daryl teaching at the Nova Scotia Community College. So we ended up, um, I ended up, uh, you know, signing up for one of Daryl's courses and kind of started my formal training in, in parapsychology from there. And I mean, since then, uh, I've taken so many different courses now. One of the, one of the best places, I will say, uh, to take your education if you're looking for reputable parapsychology courses is uh, through the Rhine Education Center. Um, they're probably one of, the, one of the best places out there, really. There's a few other ones. 
Um, in fact, Daryl and I are actually going to, we're in the process of developing an introduction to parapsychology course right now. Uh, I taught it for, uh, God, a long time actually at the Nova Scotia Community College. Um, a very, uh, yeah, well over 10 years. And then I taught it again after a break. And so uh, we thought we would, we would um, take the experience, since we know so much, and actually have it as a course, and then eventually be a part of a, a certificate you know, down the road as we develop our own stuff. Yes, and uh, we eventually want to develop other courses as well. Like Daryl, um, you know, he has a, a very deep interest in near-death experiences. I mean, you could teach an entire course on near-death experiences and death and dying and, and mm. all that stuff, right? So, and I have an interest in uh, demonology. So, um, you know, there's there's so many different things that Daryl and I can can kind of bring to you guys uh, at a reasonable, you know, reasonable cost. And uh, we have the expertise for it. So it's it's certainly something to uh, to watch out for. It's something that we're, we're serious about and, and working on. Um, and uh, of course, investigative experience wise, I, as Daryl mentioned, I joined his, uh, his group, uh, Center for Parapsychological Studies in Canada, and got introduced to field investigations, what to do, what not to do. And uh, there was a few things that the center didn't investigate, uh, which was uh, one is UFO sightings. And it's funny, it's funny as I got older, um, like, as much as I enjoy UFO sightings, most of them are uh, encounters of the first kind, which is a light in the sky. And as I got older, it was like hearing the same story over and over again. But it's not like a ghost story. Like, you mm -hmm. can hear people's ghost stories, and they're all like, you can break it down to similarities. Yeah. But each one is, like, different. Whereas a UFO sighting, like, it's a light in the sky. We don't know what it is. You can't see it. Um, I think it was following me, you know, um, usual stuff. The usual and stuff, yeah. yeah. so we didn't do it. So Elliot then started his own group as sort of an adjunct group to look into the stuff that we couldn't because UFO at the time was untouchable. If you looked into UFOs, you weren't respectable. And this was prior to the destruction of the uh, reputation of ghost hunting, um, once the um, internet and, and um, TV took over. Yes. But, um, you know, so, yeah, so we, we were interested and we shared data, but we, uh, we personally stayed uh, away from it. Um, and I think there was a couple things that, you know, that were different that you found. Uh, that were interesting to me, and I'm not um, a believer or haven't been a believer in, in UFOs, uh, at least of the third kind, uh, the, or the um, alien hypothesis, extraterrestrial. Um, there's something going on, I don't know what it is. I suspect it's military, but anyway, we don't want to get it. That's an argument we'll have another time. Oh, oh for sure, and, and, that's a, and that's the thing like what Daryl said, like back then, um, if you heard UFO or UFO investigator, you were thinking nut job, like plain and simple. Um, in today's world, and now you've got the Pentagon and U.S. government, uh, you know, there's a center that sits on the intelligence committee that flat out gave media statements, and even Barack Obama has given media statements saying, listen, there are UFOs, unidentified flying objects. We have no idea what they are. Um, they did say that they're, uh, they seem to be in really interested in a lot of the secret U.S. military uh, installations. Didn't Trump also kind of backhandedly say something about it? He did, and I always thought that uh, if there was going to be a president that admitted uh, that uh, <laughs> there was extraterrestrials, that Trump would have been the one to do yeah. it. Oh, and, yeah. and he never did during his term. Uh, he did. There was one interview I think I saw where he kind of talked about Area 51, but he was very vague about it. Yeah, um, probably mean, because he never ever learned about it. <laughs> no, well, that's funny because in the interview I saw of Obama, um, Obama said one of the first things he did when he became president was uh, yeah. he's like, "Get me the stuff on the UFOs. I want to, I want to like learn about it or whatever." But I mean, at the end of the day, uh, you know, there, there's a huge uh, disclosure that's about to happen right now with the U.S. government yeah. um, coming out uh, any day now, actually, um, but. You know, they, they've now admitted that there are UFOs. They don't know what it is. They don't know if it's terrestrial. They don't know if it's uh, environmental. They don't know if it's extraterrestrial. Um, so it's, it, it, it's interesting. And same with ghost hunting. Like you said, at the time, um, 
it was respectable still because you had, uh, and we'll talk about the history of the psychical research, but you had professional psychical researchers at the time. So before TV and before mainstream media, um, you know, it was, uh, although mainstream science kind of shied away from it, it, it was still respectable in the parapsychology field, whereas now um, there's kind of a melee going on, uh, especially because of the TV and the media. <laughs> uh, um, but uh, yeah, so and and that's kind of it's kind of our, our our background, I guess, like our, our story. So I just kind of continued learning, you know, about parapsychology, uh, self-taught, and and through other professionals. I've been lucky to st uh, study under a bunch of different, you know, parapsychologists from all over the world. Um, you know, we, we've got a lot Some of, of which we're going to have as guests yes. on this podcast. Yes, so. we will. In fact, uh, next episode, we will have a, a very popular uh, parapsychologist that you've probably seen on TV uh, to talk about poltergeists. Um, but, uh, yeah, so things, things have certainly changed uh, over the years. But, uh, I mean, this is what Daryl and I do. and uh, It keeps know. evolving. Yeah, and you, know? and you have to adapt. You have to adapt to... To, to how it's changing. Uh, there's different uh, phenomena that, that shows up, uh, you know, every once in a while. Yeah. Uh, that's new, like you said, uh, you know, crop circles weren't a thing back, back in the day. And I'm still looking for, believe me, although I have a more skeptical nature about a lot of ghost stories sometimes, um, I need, if I ever come across one that is routine, that happens a lot and happens almost like on, like every Friday afternoon at three o'clock, for instance, there's a story on um, King's Edge, uh, Edge Hill, um, up in uh, uh, Windsor, and supposedly on New Year's Day there's a nun who sits in a chair on the sports field, and she shows supposedly shows up. Now that's easily, you know, identifiable, verifiable, and we can learn something like that. Um, nobody's ever said they saw her, so obviously it's just plain folklore. But it would be fascinating if there were, if, if we got, you know, something like that we could actually sink our teeth into. Because although we've gone a lot into the into the research side of things, um, we're still open to the investigative side of things as well. So, it's um, but it's it's evolving, and unfortunately because of, you know, all the crappy supposedly reality um, ghost hunting shows which show you how not to investigate a ghost and we'll have an episode on how you really look for ghosts and um, yeah so it, it that's completely destroyed and of course Bigfoot's uh, was never really had much respect but that's gone as well so um, but then again it's destroyed the respect of just about everything democracy you name it so I mean it's almost like a monster the internet and and uh, and, and bad reality TV shows there's just yeah um, morals you name it so but um, yeah so that's why we're looking for new data and and good data and anything that was you know it's been on TV we ignore <laughs> we certainly do so Daryl, let's uh, for this first episode, we wanted to kind of introduce people to what parapsychology is and what it isn't. Yeah. Um, so why don't we uh, why don't we discuss that? Okay. Now, parapsychology is very narrowly defined, and it has to do with the mind and the mind only. Uh, obviously, in general. Um, population it's thought to investigate ghosts and UFOs and Bigfoot and everything else. Um, it's almost synonymous with the paranormal, but it's not. It has to do with the mind. Um, the biggest part is ESP. And so ESP, which stands for ex extrasensory perception, um, is telepathy, clairvoyance, recognition, precognition, uh, and general ESP. Now, I'm going to talk about ESP. Elliot will talk about the second half of it, which is psychokinesis, um, and the more exciting part, actually. So how did I get thrown into this part <laughs> to do this one? Anyway, I'm not doing the boring one. It's the, pol <laughs> it's the poltergeist that I like. Anyway, uh, ESP, um, there is, uh, so we do ESP, psychokinesis, but we also sometimes investigate ghosts. Because there is a theory that 
some ghosts are projections from our minds. Either they're not there, um, because, but because of environmental factors or uh, organic factors or whatever, it triggers um, you know, a vision. Now, the, now, then we get into why is it you know, triggering a vision? Is it because there's an image that's imprinted on the environment? Is it because um, there's a part of our brain um, that seems to be right here, that seems to be highly related to, cycle, to parapsychology? Um, so yeah, so it's, it's, but that is the only part, supposedly, that uh, we investigate. But of course, everybody gets into ghosts because that's the fun part. And although I taught parapsychology as a general um, course, I had split it up originally into two after a while, and I was teaching one part ghosts because that's what everybody wanted, and that's what I wanted to do anyway because I find ghosts incredibly interesting. So um, not as good as poltergeist, but anyway, <laughs> some fascinating things with poltergeist, especially here in Nova Scotia. So um, that are really interesting, like a vampire poltergeist, which is... We'll talk about, I'll give you that story someday. So that's essentially what parapsychology is and the first half of it, which is ESP. Now, Elliot will give you the more exciting part. Um, although I will say, I was going to teach a course at the college and actually prior to the pandemic, I was going to say, let's set up a laboratory and do some experiments. The reason why ghost hunting is so popular is because you don't have to have a laboratory. But a lot of people have a shortcut and they have a psychic medium. Um, and so therefore, um, the psychic medium does all the work, essentially. The problem is with that is they haven't gone to the laboratory first to see if, that, if they actually have that attribute. So, um, but anyway, that's neither here nor there. So um, Elliot will do the PK side of parapsychology. So as Daryl said, the second part of parapsychology is what's called PK or psychokinesis. So there's different types of psychokinesis. There's micro psychokinesis, macro psychokinesis, and now there's bio psychokinesis. So micro psychokinesis is the belief that human consciousness, the mind, can affect the physical environment, but it can only be detected through statistical means. And what that means is if anyone's familiar with parapsychology and you see the old dice rolling machines, they believe that people could affect the outcome of the dice. And then we switch to random uh, number generators, believing that people could um, use uh, their mind to affect the system. And then we have random event uh, generators now, which could be anything. It could be images or guessing. Um, for example, they'll have uh, a split screen, and you'll have to guess which image appears on what side of the screen. All kinds of different tests that they can do in the laboratory. Um, but micro-PK can only be detected in the laboratory through statistical means. Macro-PK, on the other hand, uh, is more interesting. Like Daryl said, uh, kind of falls under the poltergeist stuff, but I'll get into that in a second. But macro-PK would be stuff that we can see with our senses. So for example, levitation is, uh, falls under macro-psychokinesis. And then bio-psychokinesis is when you get into the human consciousness being able to affect a biological system. And you really see that in um, energy healing. Uh, you see Reiki, uh, re you know, Reiki masters able to heal people. The only thing with bio-PK from all the research uh, and studies that have been done is that so far they have had no way to prove that bio-PK exists. And the reason for that is, is there's just too many other factors that can occur for spontaneous healing uh, of the system. So, for example, if somebody's got cancer and they go to, uh, you know, they're running out of options and they go through to see, uh, you know, Reiki Master, for example, they don't know if it's the energy and the healing that has, uh, you know, stopped the spread of the cancer cells. Maybe it was some of the medication that the people were taking beforehand that finally kicked in. Uh, or changed their biological system. Maybe it was the chemotherapy. Um, so they really don't, can't really narrow that down yet. 
uh, but I mean, things are always changing in the field and, and maybe at, at some point they will be able to detect it. I do know that there's uh, <laughs> biophotons that they have been able to detect um, in the uh, laboratory. They've seen energy coming from people's hands in the laboratory. So, um, you know, certainly I, I believe BioPK exists. It's just a matter of proving proving it. And there's a difference between evidence and proof. So evidence is something that shows something else exists or is true. Uh, it refers to pieces of information or facts and it's suggestive. Whereas proof is evidence or an argument establishing that a fact uh, of the truth is a statement. Uh, there's a logical conclusion that we arrive to after analyzing the evidence and it's concrete and conclusive. So a lot of people mix up uh, the terms evidence and proof. And it wasn't until even just a couple of years ago, especially being a law enforcement officer, that um, you know I was able to decipher the difference between the two because we always use proof beyond a reasonable doubt, and we always use you know police are collecting evidence at crime scenes. So that's important uh, important information to to understand, especially when investigating the paranormal. And then after micro, macro, and bio PK, we have what's called a recurrent spontaneous psychokinesis. And that's where uh, it, it gets tied into poltergeist. So RSPK is when the human consciousness is affecting the physical environment. It could be micro PK, although you wouldn't be able to detect it because you're not in the laboratory. It's mostly macro PK. So you know, in poltergeist cases, you see objects being thrown with strange tra uh, trajectories. You see, um, uh, you know, it could be it could be some levitation occurring. You normally don't see an apparition. If you do see an apparition, it's very distorted. It's like a black blob, basically, is what it's been described as. Because a poltergeist, although German for noisy ghost or noisy spirit, that was the theory back in the day, in the 1800s. Since then, though, uh, we've been able to determine that it's, uh, it's not actually caused by a ghost. Um, it's what they believe to be psychokinesis, caused by a living agent, which is a person. And it can also be multiple living agents as well. There's been cases where two different people are, are giving off uh, RSPK. And then the third part of parapsychology, which I actually think, um, it's funny, Daryl was arguing that I gave him uh, the crappy spot, ES, or the crappy topic, ESP. And I will admit to as well, um, when I was younger, I was just interested in ghosts too. Like when, whenever I was taking a parapsychology course and the topic of ESP came up or even psychokinesis came up, I had very little interest in that. And it wasn't until I got older and realized that you need to understand the foundations of parapsychology in order to understand ghosts and hauntings because ghosts use ESP to project themselves to us and they also use psychokinesis to move things, to open those cupboard doors, to lock and unlock doors. So if you don't understand the basics of parapsychology, you're not going to have a good foundation for my favorite topic, uh, survival. And I'll let Daryl explain survival. So the third part of parapsychology, as I said before, uh, had to do with survival after death. And that brings up a whole bunch of things about consciousness, our minds, um, do we have a soul. Um, parapsychology is not interested in, in religious um, beliefs. And, or trying to prove a soul, um, it's more interested in seeing if there's any way that our mind reacts with the environment somehow. And, um, but the interesting thing, and, and what I did my doctoral thesis on, was near-death experiences. And with all parapsychology, all the evidence we have, the appearance is that it's very rare and weak. So we're not going to, there's going to be no Superman effect where somebody can walk in and lift a car up, you know, off somebody that's uh, been run down. Um, so the best way of evidence so far seems to be through near-death experiences. 
Now, that has to do with our consciousness leaving the body as the body dies, and the body is dead. This started back in the late 70s, and since then, and there have been BS stuff about um, this in the light, that in the light, blah, 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 and now, of course, there's all the personal things about, oh, I died, and you find out they didn't really die, they were just in a coma, and things like this. Um, but the parapsychological, the scientific investigation, keeps adding to the evidence that near-death experiences are true. The skeptics come out with the same old stuff and they can't touch it. So if anything proves that there is survival, it's going to be near-death experiences. Now, I don't think I have to tell you what near-death experience is. Um, <laughs> I go in through all the, the different uh, um, segments of it because I'm, everybody practically knows it. One interesting part of it, of course, like I said, is our consciousness leaves our body. Now, that could be tested. There are people that say they can do this. And so we could rig a very simple experiment of something up top with written on it, uh, something that nobody would ever guess. And the person would be down here on a bed, let's say. They would say they would leave their body go up and read what's there, come back down, and tell us what's there. Very simple, actually. Um, it's, it's amazing. A lot of this is very simple. But um, so far, it's been kind of eh, mishmash of, of whether or not it's real or not and, and, and all that. And um, so, but it's very, very interesting. Of course, that's Elliot's uh, field. Uh, he loves consciousness and OBEs and, and this kind of thing, out-of-body experiences. Whereas I tend to think more about near-death experiences and, and ghosts. Uh, another one also has to do with reincarnation, but I think it's total bullshit, so I'm not even going to go there. Um, if Elliot wants to talk about it, he can, but that can be destroyed so easily. Yeah. Eh. So, yes, yeah, so that's survival. Well, I think we got our first duel, yeah. Carol. <laughs> um, so, have, have, you, like, have you heard of any of the cases, uh, you know, like University of Virginia the Medical uh, Department, they have the Perceptual Studies Division uh, mm. that basically studies reincarnation. And there's been a few extreme cases where, uh, like, for example, there was a little boy that always thought of Hollywood and movies, and he was obsessed with this actor. And of course, uh, you know, his parents always heard him talk about Hollywood and this actor, and so they dug out some old photos, and he identified himself as one of these people in the mm -hmm. photos. Yeah. And of course, they did all the research, and they found out who this person was and how he died, and it was pretty much exactly like what the little boy had been describing to his parents and stuff like that. What's your take on, you know, cases like that? A lot of reincarnation cases are children. Um, especially in India, because you can be, if you're reincarnated from a rich family, um, obviously your family's going to be suddenly rich if you're poor. Um, problem with reincarnation is somebody comes along afterwards and kicks sand in their face. It, it, there's no good proof. Um, in, for instance, there could be contamination. He liked Hollywood. And, and this, and obviously his parents would talk about it. There would be books about it. It's on TV. Um, so the mind carries everything with it. Every experience we ever had is in there somewhere. <clears throat> Most of it is, un is unretrievable, but um, so yeah, so you, you, there's no way you can take out the contamination factor so that you can say definitively, you know, this child, was reincarnated from you know uh, um, a Hollywood actor or, or anybody. And do you ever notice it's always somebody famous? It's or I love the ones that are King Arthur. That's really good because King Arthur didn't exist. So <laughs> so I really love yeah. those ones. Joan of Arc's another one. Yeah, oh, yeah, Joan of Arc. Yeah, nobody's a plain boring. Well, once in a while they're a plain boring uh, uh, person, but most of it is you know they they want to be famous, and that's. That's fine, you know, it's whatever. But as a scientist, it's unprovable. Um, there's too many, there's too many variables to knock to to pin down. So, um, 
and it's been destroyed so many times, or, or you know, so many cases have been destroyed that sounded so good. Um, that's why I, I would, uh, South Park would say shenanigans, but uh, also BS uh, would be my personal thing. But South Park uh, characters would call shenanigans on that one because um, it's not proved. You actually provable. mentioned something that I think is very important. Uh, you had mentioned um, the kind of socio-cultural factors that can come into play. So, for example, you said, you know, maybe the, the child had heard the parents talking about it. Um, you know, after the child had brought it up, you know, maybe he overheard some conversation or whatever occurring in the background. And through a lot of investigations that I've done as well, um, sometimes there is family dynamics there. Like, you'll have one person in the family kind of pushing towards the fact like this place is haunted right and they'll have like that kind of influence and that push on yeah. on people so i think that is a very important thing to mention especially when you're doing investigations in parapsychology uh to be cognizant of that's why in-person interviews if you can go to the home uh, obviously pandemic is is causing havoc in every field but if you can go to the home and interview the people in their natural environment um, separately separately of course uh, audio video is the best evidence um, that's the best because you can kind of see you can kind of see what's going on after a while obviously everyone kind of presents themselves at best at first but as time goes on and people let their guard down you'll be able to kind of pick up on it if there's any sort of like dynamic going on much like us <laughs> we're a little stiff it's been a while since we did TV but yeah we'll relax and get used to each other and yeah, smack each other around, especially if he brings up that damn thing from Toronto. I haven't brought that up yet. I might and save that for bringing it up. I might save that for another episode. Yeah, we're gonna save that for. That's gonna be an interesting one. Um, <laughs> no, that's yeah. That, no, it's really interesting um, that you brought that point up. I, I think that was good. Um, we'll just talk a little bit about uh, about the history, I guess, of psychical research. Um, so, I mean, obviously, people have been interested in the supernatural uh, since the beginning of time. I mean, really, the Roman Catholic Bible is based on a lot of supernatural events that occurred there. Yep. Uh, Jesus was uh, an exorcist. Uh, there's many counts that uh, he's exorcised demons, um, you know, from people that he encountered. So, it's always been something that uh, has existed, the fascination of it. It wasn't really, though, until the 1800s that we started to seriously take a look at it. So, yeah, it became science. There was a renaissance in the 17th century. Science began to be developed, but it really wasn't until the 19th century, the 1800s, um, that protocols were developed. And um, that's what the, the exciting part began. Because before, you were just told stories. But then in the 1800s, all of a sudden, you had to prove your story. So let's see you do this or whatever type of thing. And that's exactly what happened. So uh, for example, one of the first things that kind of pops up in the history of parapsychology is uh, a belief or some people call it a religion, but uh, spiritualism. <laughs> um, so spiritualism basically started. In Canada, unfortunately. <clears throat> and, and I was really interested to find this out. So it started with uh, the Fox sisters, Maggie and Katie. And they were actually Canadian. Um, they were uh, born in uh, Consecon, uh, Ontario, I believe. I can never say the word. Either. Yeah, it's it's Consecon, <laughs> Ontario. Um, basically, it's uh, just outside of Belleville, a uh, little farming community. And uh, they couldn't basically make ends meet, and they had to move to uh, Rochester, New York. But whenever you um, read the literature about the Fox sisters, it's always uh, they're from Rochester, New York. But... Actually, they're Canadian, and, and they were from Upper Canada. Um, so what happened is they moved to this place in Rochester, and the girls start um, allegedly hearing uh, knocks and raps on the wall. And so they start to try and communicate with the spirit. They ask questions, and in response, they get knocks and raps, much like poltergeist activity. Um, it became kind of very popular within their household and then they started to invite their neighbors over. So the neighbors would come over and they would, uh, you know, see this display and they became very fascinated by it. A few years later, uh, around, that was around 1848, so around 1850, two years later, uh, New York City now had hundreds of thousands of people interested in spiritualism and then it spread over to Europe. 
And what happened is the Society for Psychical Research, which was founded in, I believe, 1882, um, started over in the UK and they were psychical researchers is what they were called and they started to attend a lot of these uh, spiritualism seances and start to investigate all these uh, physical mediums and they found out that a lot of them was rife with fraud. Uh, in fact one of the things uh, that the term you would probably be familiar with through Ghostbusters is called ectoplasm. So one thing that these physical mediums would do is they would have ectoplasm coming out of their nose, out of their mouth, out of their ears, basically out of any sort of orifice. But the psychical researchers that managed to get a hold of this material found that it was nothing more than cheesecloth, um, gauze, uh, just natural things that the psychics had basically implanted on or in themselves. Uh, to this day, nobody has actually caught ectoplasm and mm -hmm. brought it to the lab to test it physically, you know, scientifically. Yeah. And you know how much I want to prove a ghost. And I'm so disappointed um, with the fraud. And that was the problem, why parapsychology suddenly di dived a little bit. Um, so, yeah, you know, I, I roll my eyes because when, when a medium, psychic medium comes along, because it... it it, you can only have your heart broken so many times, I guess the saying is. And uh, spiritualism, you know, uh, was a religion. It fit the, the, the definition, I say. But, uh, yeah, it, 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 uh, it was total BS, I mean, unfortunately. And, uh, but it, uh, I'm sure you'll mention World War I. It was very popular in World War I. And maybe it gave comfort to people whose sons died in a stupid, ridiculous war that didn't need to happen, and certainly didn't need to go for four years. Um, so, yeah, but anyway. Well, and that's, you, and that's just what happened. So you had this, this movement start, and then after World War I, of course, as Daryl said, many people lost their lives, and we still see this to this day. Um, and mediums or psychics have become very good at cold reading. Uh, so, for example, you walk in to see a psychic, one of the first things they're going to say is, you're here because you've experienced a loss. And most people have. Daryl's lost, you know, both his parents. I've lost my father. So It can be a pet. It can be yeah. anything. You know? and, and that's what happens. <laughs> Budgie the, bird. The psychic starts to, uh, you know, narrow it down. Like, they'll say, like, oh, well, did you lose a pet recently? Well, I lost a dog a year ago. Or, well, did you lose your job recently? Well, actually, yeah, I got laid off from the pandemic. So, you know what I mean? Like, they, they're very talented. They are talented, not psychically, but they are talented mm. in reading people. And I don't get disappointed with them. I get pissed off because and they're called grief vampires for a reason. Um, where spiritualism was more of a pure, innocent kind of thing um, and, might, and might have helped people. Um, nowadays, it's it, the psychic, psychic mediums who were originally just mediums and then for some reason at the end of the 90s they got a bit of a, a bump uh, up, up uh, and they were psychic mediums, I guess, maybe to take the more money from people for more things that they allegedly do. So yeah, they don't... Spiritualism, I almost look at it as benign, although some people can look at it and say, that's, you know, that's, that's terrible what they did. But it was, it's nothing compared to what's going on now and what definitely went on, um, you know, in the early 2000s. And, uh, yeah, they are grief vampires. And, and, that, and that's what happened is after the World War, all these people wanted, they heard about spiritualism, they heard about individuals being able to communicate with the dead. So all these people, of course, naturally would flock to a medium and ask them to, uh, you know, communicate with their loved one. And some of them had like reoccurring customers, you know, they would come back because obviously if, if, if you think that you're in communication with a loved one and the only way to do it is through this medium that you also have to pay money to, <laughs> I mean, you're probably going to continue to do it. Um, and so that, that also, again, you know, got the psychical researchers involved to investigate these. Um, they would go to seances. They found a lot of the seances. They had a helper involved. So it might not be the medium doing it, but there was basically a helper in the room that could do things like help levitate the, the table. 
There's videos on YouTube where you can see if you get your foot underneath the table, you can kind of like lift it up with your foot. Don't even have to move that much, just kind of wiggle your toes and the table will yeah. start to levitate. Um, a lot of them did it in, um, uh, they were in uh, like dark kind of chambers, I guess is the best way to describe it, where they may have had access to different tools. Uh, of course, the psychical researchers weren't allowed to have cameras or have lights on. It had to be in the dark. Uh, a lot of suspicious stuff. And mm -hmm. uh, most of that um, during that time was proven to be fraud. Uh, Interesting thing too, just to interject again, which I've seen to be doing a lot of, um, back then, the people doing the investigating yes. were respectable people. Oh, absolutely. So you had Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the creator of Sherlock Holmes, and my, one of my most fa uh, favorite mo second favorite movie, because John Carpenter's The Fog is the first, and uh, The Hearse is also good too. But anyway, is Hound of the Baskervilles. And so you had him, Sir William Crooks, um, um, so many others, and these were respected people in their field. Um, they were scientists, they were taken seriously, and you know, any good feeling and support towards parapsychology was because of them, because of what they did. And uh, so that was a major thing. Um, and I mean, a lot of them got very, you know, very um, upset and some got very uh, cynical because so many were, fa you know, found to be fake. But um, what I was really, uh, I find interesting and fascinating is Science, they always people always complain, science doesn't investigate something paranormal. Well, we do, and other scientists have, and there's just not enough, if there's not enough evidence to, to say such a thing exists or likely exists, you're not going to spend money and, and go off and chase things. But back then, there was a lot of gentlemen scientists, and you heard the term gentlemen explorers, the ones who went up Everest, for instance, or tried to go up Everest, and um, the uh, Fawcett, who went down to uh, South Africa, excuse me, not South Africa, uh, South America, and eventually got lost in the, in the uh, jungle and, and died, him and his son. So you had this kind of thing, and these were, it was a totally different way of looking at um, the paranormal. Now, in a sense then, they were wondering, does it exist? Yes. Now it exists, so let's find the evidence, which is the wrong way to do. Um, you know, and so if you go into a situation and then you th you're pretty sure that it's true, you have a preconception that, that, that uh, there's a ghost in this place because it's dark and dusty and old, um, you know, you're going to find what you, what you want to find. But, um, and of course, there are no respectable people um, chasing ghosts in dusty basements. Um, they're in the laboratory now. And you don't hear about them because it's not, um, it's not glamorous. It's not sexy enough. Nope, not in the least. No, you're, a, you're absolutely right. Um, and that's, that's, exactly, uh, that's exactly what happened. In fact, uh, you had people from all kinds of different disciplines that were psychical researchers. Some were psychologists. Um, actually, Houdini, uh, yeah. who was a magician, actually was involved in investigating these mediums because as a magician, number one, he was probably thinking that if they can do this kind of stuff, like as a magician, maybe it would be kind of cool to do in the shows. But he wanted to understand how they were doing it, and uh, he was a great debunker of that because he knew the, the tricks of the eye that a magician could do. And so Houdini was yeah. actually, if, if you look him up, he was actually a parapsychological investigator. Exactly. And for any amateur um, ghost hunting group, you should have somebody who's a magician just because... You know, if you're going to go to, you know, a medium, psychic medium or stuff like this, you've got to have somebody who knows the tricks of the trade. So anyway, I think we've given an overview for you. And uh, part of our forthcoming uh, podcast, of course, we're going to argue a lot about things. Um, we seem very buddy-buddy now because we are buddies, but we disagree with a lot of things. We're going to have a lot of good guests coming on. Um, and so I'm excited about it. We'll have specials with, with uh, seasonal specials, Halloween, for instance, that kind of thing. So uh, I'll be telling ghost stories uh, as well. I'll start with Nova Scotia and Atlantic provinces and move out, move on. And um, so, yeah, we're, we're going to have a lot of little things, uh, enough to keep you, um, 
keep you interested. This one might be a little boring being, you know, having to give you a background. But, um, you know, we're, we're going to do it so that you'll like it. Stay with us. And, and it's, it's important to get that foundation. And, uh, and once, you, once you have that foundation, which, you know, hopefully you do now, um, we've given you some stuff that you can go research yourself. Uh, and I always believe in that too, you know, especially in the paranormal, like, you know, don't just take somebody's word for us, like, you know, reach out and, and to other experts and, and go to their websites and, you know, do your own research and make your own decision. Um, but, uh, you know, our next, our next episode, we're hoping to have a guest. We won't name him yet. Uh, he's the one that actually got me into parapsychology technically. You got, got Daryl in parapsychology and he's actually, uh, he does do magic. Uh, I believe, uh, he is more on the mental, uh, mentalism side. So there's magicians, which do the tricks of the trade, um, and the sleight of hand, but then there's the mentalists, which, uh, incorporate the supernatural into their, into their performance. So it'll be really interesting to talk to him. Yeah. Um, you can check us out on, uh, you know, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, ghostprojectcanada.com, uh, ppri.net. You'll have more than enough information to, uh, go through on those websites. Yeah. We'll be on YouTube eventually as well. And, uh, so, you know, hit the like and subscribe and all that stuff. You've heard that a million times. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And, uh, this, yeah, we will put this on, uh, on YouTube. So yeah, give us a like and a, channel. and a subscribe and, uh, that way you can follow, follow along with us. Yep. And, uh, if you have any questions as well, uh, feel free to email us as well and, uh, you know, we'll respond to you and, yep. and maybe we can that even we address some of them on the next show. Exactly. We'd be happy to, you know, give us, ask us something or tell us something and uh we'll be happy to read your you know your experience or answer your question as well so um it's a it's a very loose uh show you know so that's parapsychology <laughs> um i promise you the forthcoming episodes will be a lot more exciting much more dynamic we'll be arguing about stuff we're going to have special guests um all tell ghost stories um elliot i'm sure will tell some stories as well so um, now that the boring introduction stuff is done, we can get into the meat and potatoes of parapsychology <laughs> and mostly survival type work. I mean, that's what Daryl and I are most interested yeah. in. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, I think the next few episodes will be really exciting. Yeah. And we're going to be doing seasonal ones as well. Specials for Halloween and Christmas. And yes, Christmas is a haunted time in the UK. But uh, until then, but long before then, we'll be doing other episodes. And so I'm looking forward to the next one because our guest is got me in is the person who got me into parapsychology actually so and he's also a magician and mentalist so i think you'll find uh you'll find what he has to say very fascinating yep until next time just like dr bankman <laughs> we'll see you next time the dueling parapsychologist podcast an educational and entertaining podcast with canadian parapsychologist elliot van dusen and daryl walsh to reach out to the dueling parapsychologists see our facebook page twitter and instagram accounts or email us directly at info at ppri.net